remember, I appreciate that message of song. I appreciate you singing the hymns this morning. I think those old hymns have a, most of them have a really great message. They're doctrinally saturated, uh, whereas a lot of uh, newer things maybe not. But I love the old hymns, and I'm glad you're here today. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. And so we'll be in that second book, Mark, chapter number 3. I want to just say thanks to uh, all of you who did such a marvelous job uh, doing the things that needed to be done while we were gone. Uh, I was a little bit offended, though. Nobody called and said, hey, we need you, Pastor. We can't figure this out. I thought, what? I thought I was more needed than that. No, <laughs> I'm glad nothing went wrong. I'm glad nobody had to call and say, we've got a problem. I'm glad everything went smooth. And I uh, heard that the guys that spoke did well, the singers did well, People came to church, and, and uh, you just kept on serving God, and that's the way it ought to be. I appreciate that. We're in Mark chapter number 3, and we'll just read uh, a couple of verses here, and uh, start in verse number 14. We have Jesus here in the early days of his ministry as he selects his disciples, his apostles. He had 12 men that he worked with and invested his life in these 12 men and later on, we learned that uh, they turned the world upside down. And so a small ministry is not a bad ministry. I think some people admire the big churches, and they've got hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. And, and I, wish we had, uh, I wish we had all we could hold in the building today. But the truth is, Jesus had 12 men that he worked with. Is that soaking in? He had 12 men that he invested in, and those 12 men turned the world upside down as they interacted with the other apostles and as they spoke and preached the gospel and planted churches. And so it's amazing what the power of God can do even with a small group of people. And so we're going to focus in on one person here beginning in verse number 14. And he, Jesus, ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. So notice the progress here. He wanted some men that would be with him. Are you walking with Jesus? And so he wanted some people that he could depend on, upon to be with him. And then it says that he might send them. And so God has a purpose for these 12 guys. And uh, verse 15 says, And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And so he wanted that power to be within them. He wanted to impart to them some power that they could accomplish what they could not accomplish on their own. You and I, without Jesus, are a great big zero. <laughs> In verse 16, it says, And Simon, he surnamed Peter. We're going to talk about Peter today. I want to preach on this subject, When the Light Comes On. Have you ever heard that saying? The light's on, but nobody's home. Well, when the light comes on in a believer's life, when the light comes on, things happen. And we're going to talk about this happening in Peter's life. The light came on several times during Peter's life and ministry. And the light maybe has come on for some of you today. But here in the life of Peter, we're going to see that when it first came on, it flamed. And then it flickered. And then it focused, and then it flourished. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we love you today, and we thank you for the word of God. We believe every word of it from cover to cover, and we believe that these particular verses that we'll look at today have a, a special purpose in our lives today. Help us to put the things of the world out of our minds right now, this instant. Help us not to be worried about work tomorrow. Help us not to be worried about lunch today. Help us not to be worried about the sickness that has afflicted us. Help us to put all those things out of our mind and just focus upon you today, Lord. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We spent 10 days in Colorado. I was on staff in Denver at a church there for five years back in the 90s and and we still maintain friendships with some of those people. 
and uh, some of them have moved on and serve in other churches, but we still maintain some contact with them, and it's good to visit with old friends. One of them that we saw while we were out there last week was Jeff Ion. Jeff is a special friend. I met him in 1992 when I moved to Colorado to uh, be on staff at Mile High Baptist Church and to start a Bible college there. And Jeff, was, uh, he was ready. He was excited. He's still excited today. He was excited to be one of the first enrollees in the Bible college that we started there. And, and a light came on earlier when Jeff saw the Lord. When he got saved, the light had originally come on in his heart. And if you're saved today, the light came on in your heart. And, uh, and so Jeff was saved and he was, now the light had come on and he was, uh, he was ready to do something for God and he wanted to go to Bible college to prepare to do something for the Lord. And then uh, the light came on again when he started serving in the ministry there. And, and, uh, and then the light came on again when he passed through Arkansas. When we were start, first starting, Brother Aaron said that uh, we'll be coming up on our church anniversary in a week or so. And uh, we'd been going for about a year or so, maybe a year and a half, when Brother Jeff and his wife and their kids and a friend of his, uh, Keith Gallegos, and his wife and their kids, they were passing through Arkansas after we had moved here from serving on staff and uh, being friends with them in Colorado years before. They were coming through. They went down to Florida to look at a Bible college there, and on their way back, they didn't seem to be really sure if they ought to go move down to Florida to go to Bible college there or not. And so... Uh, we talked about different options, you know, that they, that they might do and, and uh, get an education where they can serve the Lord, be trained and all. And so they announced to me at supper one night, Brother Jeff came over and put his arms, hands on my shoulder and said, Brother Brooks, we want to make an announcement. We're, uh, we're planning on moving here, both of our families, and helping you and Liberty Baptist Church to get it rolling. I said, are you, sh you sure? You're kidding me? No, no, we're serious. We're moving here. If you'll let us. And I said, well, man, you're welcome. Come on. And so they all moved here. And, uh, and so they, they served here with us for, I think, almost a year. And uh, then they moved back to Colorado. They couldn't make a living here like they had been accustomed to in real estate out there. And so they moved back. And so then they served in various churches out there for a few years. And here recently, uh, the light has come on for Brother Jeff again. And he called me a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago now actually and told me, he said, Brother Brooks, you've always encouraged me to start a church and, and minister to my own people. He's, uh, he's a Hispanic and uh, I always call him a phony Mexican. He can't speak Spanish. <laughs> and uh, and I, I called him phony Mexican last week. He couldn't eat a hot pepper without crying. And so I said, man, you're just a phony Mexican. You ain't real. And we go on to each other that way a lot. Well, he, the light came on for him again, and he said, I'm going to do what you suggested to me years ago. I'm going to start a church here in Denver and reach my people. And I said, man, that's great. And I'm all for him, and I wish we could help support him, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later on, help him get rolling there in Denver like they helped us get rolling here. We might not be able to go out there and serve with him, but we could help him get started financially maybe a little bit. And so... The light has come on in Jeff's life a number of times and now at last he has come to the place after 20 some odd years after my encouragement first began to start a church there among your people in Denver because you know each ethnicity listens usually a little better to people from their own ethnicity and just like I'm a hillbilly and so I'm good with hillbillies. <laughs> right Brother Joey? We're, we're hillbilly ministers and uh and Brother Jeff is going to start a church, his, his current church where he serves and teaches Sunday school in. His pastor's behind him. The church is behind him. And so the light has come on, and there's a big change takes place when the light comes on. And so what we're talking about tonight or today is that sometimes the light comes on a little bit slow, and sometimes it flickers, and sometimes we have to get refocused. But finally, if we acknowledge the light, it will flourish in our lives. Maybe the light could come on for you uh, in the near future. A light should come on for every believer at some point. Would you agree with that? The light comes on 
the light comes on. Before I got saved, I was in darkness. And then one day the light came on and I got saved. And the light has come on since then in various times and various points in my life and has, as the Lord has directed me into new directions and to do new things and, and bigger things and greater things for His honor and for His glory. But a light ought to come on for all of us sooner or later. And as I thought about Jeff's journey to begin this new church that he's starting in a few weeks in Colorado and Denver, I thought, you know, all of us are not, everybody's not called to be a pastor. Everybody's not called to be a church planter. Everybody's not called to be a Sunday school teacher. Everybody's not called to be a missionary. Everybody's not called to one of those specific ministries, but the light can come on in our life so that we have direction from God and we're going in the direction that he planned for our life. That's where we're going today. I want you to notice in the life of Peter when the light came on. Number one, it flamed. Look with me in Luke chapter 5 and verse number 1. You got your Bible with you, right? We always like to have our Bible in church because that way you see it face to face, the Word of God. And this is the Word of God. Hey, this is the communication. I know some people today claim that, well, God spoke to me. Well, if God speaks to you, it's usually going to be from His Word. If you hear a voice that didn't come out of here, it might not be God's Word. Huh? Just because something impacts our, our brain, just because something stirs our heart doesn't necessarily mean that it's God, but this is always God speaking here. And so as we look in Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 1, we're going to see something when this flamed up in Peter. Everybody who was saved saw the light. But look here, chapter 5 and verse number 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, these are the people that are following Jesus, they want to hear the word of God. God's people always want to hear the word. God's people always want to hear the word. Three of us believe that. God's people always want to hear the word. Amen. Amen. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, that would be Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And uh, he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. Now who's Simon? That's Peter. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now this would just be a small fishing boat. They were, all the boats were called ships in those days. Verse number 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, which is Peter, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and we have taken nothing. Ain't caught a fish. Some of you in here can identify with that. <laughs> and he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I like that. Peter said, well, we know, we know our business. We're fishermen, but you're the Lord. And if you say let down the nets again, we'll do it. That's the way it ought to be in our life. If we think we've... We think we already know something. If Jesus says, here's what you need to do, we're going to say as a true follower of Christ, well, I thought I knew the right thing to do here, but if you say to do this, Lord, I'll do it. Amen. Well, Peter did that here. And uh, verse number six says, And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. Man, they caught so many fish, they had to have some other fellows to come and help them drag that net in. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter, here's our man, when Simon, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When we... When we get close to Jesus and we obey his word and he tells us what to do and it works like he said it would, he realized how powerful God was and how deficient he was. That brings about humility, 
Brother Joey talked about that in the Sunday school lesson this morning. Humility is a great asset for a servant of God. Not being a know-it-all, not being a critic, not being one who is always negative about everything, but being one who is humble. And so Peter said, I'm a sinful man, Lord. You've just shown me your power and my weakness. And that's a good thing to know. When we see his power and our weakness. Verse 9, For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John and the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, now watch this, from henceforth, that word henceforth means turning point. Turning point. Peter, you've been doing things your way up until now. From henceforth, here's what I want you to do. He said, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. What does he mean? Winning people to Christ. Verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they, watch this again, they forsook all and did what? Followed him. So when Peter, now Peter was saved and all of us when we, when we begin our Christian journey, it flames up at the moment we get saved. We acknowledge that. We're in darkness until we get saved. And Jesus is the light. Look in John chapter 1 and verse number 9. It says of Jesus in John 1, 9 that he was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Listen, everybody who is born into the world has some opportunity to recognize Jesus in their life. And that's what it says right there, that lighteth every man. There is something. If it's nothing more than looking up in the sky and seeing the vast universe, all the planets and stars that you can't even measure in miles but have to measure in light years, he did that. All things were created by him and for him. That's Jesus. He lights every man. Everybody who's sitting in here this morning, you're either saved or you've just been lightened. If you never heard before that salvation is through Jesus, you just heard it. <laughs> you've been lightened. And so everybody that comes into the world has the opportunity to be saved. And so it's like Joey said this morning, it's decision time. I can either accept him as the Savior or I can reject him. And uh, that's the place we have to come to. I accepted him April 13th, 1980, and have never been sorry. I mean, only a fool would get saved and say, I'm sorry I got saved and now I have to go to heaven. I'd rather go to hell. That'd be dumb, wouldn't it? <laughs> huh? So everybody has that time of enlightenment in their life. Even the atheists who reject Christ have been lightened. It's just that they refuse to acknowledge him. Even the evolutionists who believe those planets and stars created themselves. You know, I heard somebody say, you've got two choices. You can either believe God created everything out of nothing or you can believe that nothing created nothing or created everything from nothing. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Nothing created everything from nothing. <laughs> I'd rather believe in God. It takes more faith to believe that nothing created the universe than it does to believe that God created it. Hello? And so Peter saw the light of salvation already, but at this point he's seeing they fished all night. They're professional fishermen. They caught not a fish. And so Jesus shows up and he said, fellas, cast your net over here. And I said, well, we know what we're doing, but if you say so, okay, here. Wow, what a load of fish they caught. And so Peter's faith flamed up and what happened when he saw that everybody who is born again ought to be flamed up in the fact that that God has a plan for your life Peter recognized what was the plan here that everybody should catch men you know that's every, you might not be a pastor you might not be a Sunday school teacher or a missionary but God does give you the commission as a Christian to reach out with the gospel to others and to bring them to Christ you say, well, I don't have the gift of gab. Well, it's not in the gift of gab that you win them. It is in the gift of the gospel. <laughs> Anybody can say that. 
Anybody can decide Jesus died for my sins and I accepted him. You can too. And all of us who are saved ought to be trying to win others to Jesus Christ. And so for Peter's life, the light came on and he has a purpose now. He's to reach others for Christ and he's to follow him. And so we see that taking place right there. We, he recognized Jesus' power in the impossible. Do you, do you see the power of Christ in the impossible? I mean, they just got through fishing all night. They thought it wasn't possible to catch fish. But they did when they listened to him. And if Jesus directs you to do something, if it seems impossible to you, he can still do it. Amen. So the flame, the light flamed up. Number two, it flickered. Let's go to Matthew now. Chapter 26, Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 26. And here we're going to see after the flame had flared up, the lamp got brighter. You realize back in Bible days they didn't have electric light bulbs. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, they had candles and they had uh, little oil-powered Lamps like a little genie lamp that would burn. And so it flickered. It flickered. Matthew chapter 26, for instance, and verse number 40. It's before the Lord is crucified here. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. He's in great agony of prayer, and he asked Peter and... Uh, and some of that other inner circle, a couple other guys to watch and to pray while he went aside by himself to pray. And uh, he said, now just watch and pray. And he comes back and then here's what we find in verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them, what? Asleep. You know what I think? I think there's a lot of disciples of Christ who are asleep today. Maybe not snoring, maybe not snoozing and slumbering in the bed, but as they go through their life, they rarely acknowledge the Lord Jesus and the power of God that's available and never claim and call on the power of God in their life, never attempt anything big for the Lord. They're, for all practical purposes, are asleep. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, here's our man again, and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? And he said, watch and pray. He's already told them that. This is just one instance of where Peter, after the light had flamed up, listen, the light had flamed up, but now he's asleep. He's with the king of the universe, and he can't even keep his eyes open. He's asleep. And Jesus said, what? How come you're sleeping? They didn't understand or didn't want to understand. And it's possible in our Christian life, after we've been excited, that moment when we got saved, oh, do you remember it? How sweet it was the day you got saved when you realized you were a sinner bound for hell and that Jesus had died for you and you realized that his blood was payment for your sins if you'd only accept it. And by faith, you endorsed that blank check that day. You got saved and he forgave all your sins and he gave you a promise of eternal life. And then as time went on, Christianity became a little bit dull, a little bit boring. Say, I've heard all that pastor's messages before. I don't want to hear another one. I'm just going to worship on my own. I'm going to drop out of church, quit reading my Bible and go back with the old crowd again you just got tired. Maybe your light flickered. We were in a cave last week out in Manitou Springs, Colorado. Went on a tour through Cave of the Winds there in Manitou and went through probably a, an hour of tour through the various passages through that cave. Saw the stalactites and the stalagmites and all the little crystals on the wall and, and saw these various rooms in the cave and as we turned and started back around a different route to return to the entrance of the cave. The tour guide said, all right, I'm going to do something now. I hope you're not afraid of the dark, but I want you to see what the early explorers who discovered this cave, what it was like to them. 
And so she picked up a bucket that had a candle in it and lit that candle and turned off any electric lights that were on. And we're in that black cave and all you got is a little candle. And guess what? It, one candle's not going to light up a room as big as this auditorium when it's dark. <laughs> oh, you see a little glow right around the candle, but you could see something. She said, now I'm going to show you what it was like when the wind blew their candle out. <laughs> and then well, suddenly it was black. I mean totally black. We're away from the entrance of the cave and blackness seemed as thick as soup. And we're standing there in total darkness. She said, now do you understand what darkness is? Some of you may not have ever seen total darkness before, but there's not a ray of light in here anywhere because we're deep into the cave. And everybody's standing there. She said, now put your hand up in front of your face. See if you can see your fingers. Of course, we couldn't see anything. And then she lit the light again. <laughs> I was afraid we'd have to walk out of that place in the dark. Can you imagine trying to find your way back out of there in total darkness and blackness? I'm glad to see the light come back on. Well, you know, during that blackness, the sunlight was still out there outside just like it always was. It was just black in that cave where we were. And in your Christian life, you may have had the sunlight of the salvation of Jesus to come into your life at one point, but you've retreated into a cave somewhere, and now it's dark. And that's what happened to Peter. Oh, it happened a number of times to Peter. He knew the Lord is Savior. He knew what the power of God was. He knew something about the purpose of God for his life, but he got kind of caught up in some things that made him in, be in darkness again. The light flickered. It had flamed at one time, but now it's flickered. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've either been there and you finally came out of the cave or you're there in the darkness now. Saved, but it's not exciting for you anymore being saved. God wants your life to be exciting. Brother Joey said in Sunday school hour that Jesus came to, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Some of you don't have that abundant life. Some, maybe some watching by the live stream, you don't have the abundant life. You're saved and going to heaven, but boy, it's like having a steel cannonball tied on your leg. You're just dragging along. Well, this happened in Peter's life, and what happens is because Peter, there was times of adversity that came into Peter's life, and so he withdrew from Christ during those times of adversity. When hard times come, that's when you need to draw closer to him. And then there's times of impetuosity, and I use the word impetuosity because I couldn't think of another one that ended in I-T-Y. <laughs> impetuosity, Peter was impetuous. You know what impetuous means? He was quick on the trigger to blurt something out or to believe something or to do something. He acted without thinking things through. You with me? You ever do that? You ever pull the trigger too quick and you've done something or said something you wish you could take back? It's happened to all of us, hasn't it? It happened to Peter. He was always, the only time he ever pulled his foot out of his mouth was just to exchange feet. He was quick on the trigger. Some of us don't think things through and pray things through. And that happened to Peter in his impetuosity. And then there was times when he went away from Christ in his simplicity. Jesus, just before the crucifixion, Jesus tried to explain what the gospel is. He tried to explain that he's got to go to the cross, that he's got to suffer for the sins of mankind. And Peter at one point said, No, be it far from you, Lord. This is not going to happen. We don't want you to die. And Jesus said what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because without Jesus going to the cross, nobody's going to heaven. <laughs> without his suffering for our sins on the cross, without his shedding of blood, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So Jesus had to go to the cross. But Peter didn't get it. He's, he's simple-minded in a lot of things. And sometimes we just gaze at the Scripture without meditating our way through it. The Word of God takes a little bit of thinking. But we get kind of lazy and we just want to kind of take what somebody said from tradition decades ago and we've lived by that tradition saying, well, that's what he said the Word of God said. Read it and see if that's what it says. 
We need to know the Word of God and we need to let the Holy Spirit of God take it deeply into our heart. And so Peter at times was just a little too simple. In other words, he was a, one or two fries short of a happy meal. And as time went on, he learned a little more. There's times when he was just insensitive. His insensitivity. In other words, he didn't comprehend uh, people's plight and he was a little bit... Some of those disciples, you remember once, uh, I think it was uh, John said, uh, Lord, so there's some guys over here trying to follow you that doesn't do it just like we do. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> what did Jesus say? Yeah, burn them up. <laughs> no, that's not what he said. Everybody doesn't serve the Lord or worship the Lord just like we do. We believe we're doing it right or we'd change. But just because somebody does, hey, we need to allow other people to have their thoughts and their ideas and, and not be critical of them all the time. And, and Peter was sometimes, he was not only impetuous, he was insensitive. And he would probably like to, well, remember that one point where just before the crucifixion, uh, Malchus, one of the servants of the king came up and, or a servant of the high priest came up and Peter yanked out his sword and just chopped his ear off. He's trying to kill him. <laughs> but he chopped his ear off. And Jesus said, here, put that sword up. And he get, picked up that guy's ear and stuck it back on and healed his ear. <laughs> if you cut one of mine off, I'd still have big enough ears to last, do for, job for both of mine. Peter was just an intense sort of guy. Sometimes he let his light flicker because of his intensity. He was so intense about some things that he just was so... He had a zeal without knowledge at times. And sometimes in our in, intensity, we can pull away from the Lord. You know? You understand what I'm trying to say? We get intense about some things and we think just because we have this motivation that everybody ought to be just like us. It'd be a dull world if everybody was just like me. I'm glad there's variation. And sometimes we get so intense that we fail to investigate and see what God really might want us to do and what He's really said in His Word. In our intensity, we need to be careful that we don't stray from the Word of God. Peter did that. And here's the bottom line. I want you to go to Mark chapter 16. Go over to back to Mark chapter number 16. Peter was, he was pretty bad about doing stuff off the cuff and saying stuff off the cuff. Do you remember the night, uh, the night of the, the trial just before the crucifixion? And they're around, uh, oh, they're at the high priest and then they go to Pilate and they're back and forth and at one point, Peter is out there by the fire. There's a little campfire they've built out there along with the unbelievers and Peter's hanging out with the unbelievers around the campfire and the Bible says he's warming himself. Uh, you want to be careful not to be warming yourself by the devil's fire. Well, he's warming himself by the devil's fire and what happens? Jesus had already prophesied before the cock crows thrice, you'll deny me twice. Peter said, no, not me. Man, I'm way too spiritual for that. <laughs> not me. <laughs> I'm okay. But he did deny the Lord, didn't he? He denied the Lord. And the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says that at the moment that rooster crowed and Peter says to those people around the campfire, they're saying, aren't you with that Jesus fellow? And Peter said, no, not me. I don't know the man. <laughs> Have you been, ever been embarrassed to know the Lord and be around people that you didn't want to admit that you're a Christian or you go to church or you pray before you meal or something like that? Well, <clears throat> that was Peter. and His light was flickering low even though he was there by the fire. His light is flickering low. He doesn't admit that he knows the Lord. He denied him. And then the Bible says in Luke that Jesus turned and looked at Peter. In the midst of all this horrible trial that Jesus is about to be condemned and crucified, he turns and looks and locks eyes with Peter. And the Bible says Peter wept bitterly. 
when we've done something awful, we've denied Jesus somehow in our life, he is watching us and he does see us. And when we realize how we've denied him, it can cause us to weep bitterly and bring anguish into our life. Well, Peter is lower than a snake's belly after the crucifixion. He denied the Lord. He knows what he's done wrong. He's hanging out. He's trying to stay hidden, staying away from the other disciples. He doesn't even like himself. You ever been that way? You just you don't even like yourself because of what you did. Well, I'm glad Jesus is the God of second chances. In Mark 16 and verse number Seven, Jesus had been crucified. He's resurrected. He's wanting to meet up with his disciples. And, and here Jesus is telling them to uh, meet him at a certain place. And verse 7 says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him as he said unto you. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, Peter, I know how rotten you were. I know you denied me. I know you didn't want anybody to know you were a Christian. But now, Peter, I still love you. And I want you to come and meet me. He said, tell the disciples and Peter. Why did he say Peter? Why didn't he just say, just go tell the disciples to meet me over yonder on that hillside. He said, tell the disciples and Peter. You know why? Because Peter was in deep depression because he had denied the Lord. Have you been there? You ever done something to embarrass your own Christianity and you feel like you failed the Lord a thousand times over? Well, he is the God of second chances and he still loves you and he wants you back. Why he wants us, I don't know. <laughs> but he does. He said, go tell Peter I want him back. Yeah, he denied me, but tell him come on back. And there's times when you and I do things that are so embarrassing, make us so ashamed. And he still wants us back. Now, he doesn't want you to just keep living in your sin and keep embarrassing yourself with it, but he does want you back. And he takes us back. Number three, not only did the flame, the, the, the light flame up and then it flickered, Jesus took him back. Then in John 66, 666, John, the Gospel of John 666. We're almost through. Hang with me here. Don't let me lose you right now. We're almost done. John 666. Here's, uh, here's a group of disciples that's been following Jesus, and uh, he preaches some pretty hard stuff. And they're saying, Man, we can't, we can't handle this. And we're going to quit following you. Everybody's not going to like you, Christian. If Jesus couldn't hold them, why am I so high and mighty that I think everybody ought to come and hear me preach? <laughs> I wish the house was full this morning, but I'm not dumb enough to think that if Jesus didn't hold them all in his congregation, why do I think I could? Watch this. In John 6, 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him and walked no more with him then said Jesus unto the twelve, hey, look, he's had a big crowd following him. Now he's shrunk back down to the twelve. Will ye also go away? Here's our man Peter in the next verse. Watch this. In verse number 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Look, Peter had... He had flamed up when he got saved. He saw the power of God. His flame flickered down. His light began to dim. Then Jesus said, I want you back. And here we see a point where Jesus at least makes the decision there's nobody else to follow. I want you to get this one. Look, many times in our Christian life, we, we hear testimonies of people who say, well, I grew up in church and I didn't like having to go to church every Sunday. And, uh, and now that I'm grown and on my own, I'm not going to church anymore. To whom shall we go? I've had a bad experience at church. I'm not going to go back anymore. To whom shall we go? Well, I've heard these other philosophies that, uh, that maybe 
evolution caused everything and we're just all, we're all products of evolution that there is no God. To whom shall we go? Is evolution going to save you? <laughs> well, I believe science indicates that these miracles that, that the Bible claims Jesus performed, they're not scientific. Well, duh. That's why it's called a miracle. <laughs> And if you don't believe in Jesus' miracles and His power, to whom shall we go? If it's not in Jesus, it's not in anybody. To whom shall we go? Here's my encouragement from that point. If hardship comes, if doubts arise, if your religion grows a little weak, your faith is not very strong, at least hang on to Jesus. Be like Peter, and he said, the Lord said, will ye also go away? Peter said, to whom shall we go? If it's you, if it's not you, it's nobody. In your times of weakness and doubt, at least hang on to Jesus. Don't throw him away. Without him, there is no hope. Well, it's time to continue to walk with him till your light comes on again. There are times of darkness. But just hang with Jesus. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. He's still there whether you ignore him or not. Don't throw him away. Let, this is my last point, number four. His light came on again, it flourished. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 15, I'm not going to read these other verses, I'm just going to tell you about them. You can look them up if you want to write it down. Acts 1, 15, Peter finally after the resurrection, he realizes, hey, everything Jesus said is true. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the King of the universe. He is the one. Without Him there is no hope. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he led the group of 120 in the upper room. And then he went out and preached the powerful sermon of Pentecost and 3,000 souls got saved. Peter on that day stood up and he preaches to that bunch of Jews who had crucified Jesus. The ones, the very ones that he tried to keep his Christianity secret from on the day of Pentecost, he doesn't care. He doesn't give a rip. He's going to cling to Jesus no matter what. And he stands up on the day of Pentecost and he says, you have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what he tells the guys that crucified Jesus. Well, that would seem like that'd be a dangerous thing to say. They might crucify him too. He didn't care. He said, you crucified the, the king of glory. You crucified the one who came to save you. And when you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you never ask Jesus to be your Savior, when you reject Him, you're crucifying the Lord of glory all over again. And that day Peter preached with power, 3,000. So, hey, they, they stood there that day after he told them, you bunch of jerks, you crucified the king. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a good question. What shall we do? And Peter said, repent. You crucified him, you rejected him, now it's time to repent. Turn away from your rejection of him and receive him today. And the Bible says 3,000 souls got saved that day and more of them got added later on. He became a strong Christian leader <clears throat> and in, in 1 Peter chapter number 5, you'll see Peter giving instructions to the elders or the pastors of churches. Now he's not just a wimpy, Christian who's afraid to even acknowledge Christ in 1 Peter chapter 5 he's a pastor of pastors he tells pastors feed the flock of God and that's why we come to church because Peter instructed us to receive the feed of the word of God that's why we're here today Peter flourished and the light came on again and the rest of his life was marked by success for the Lord. The light can come on for you. God has a purpose for you. If it's to get saved, you ought to respond to him today. If he has called you to preach, you ought to respond to him and make it public. I don't think, hey, <clears throat> there's fewer and fewer men 
answering God's call to preach in this day. When I got saved in 1980, man, there were people surrendering to preach here and yonder in our own church, three or four or five different men surrendering to preach. And we don't see that today. Has God just decided, well, I don't need anybody preaching the gospel anymore? That God decided that. I don't. You know what I think? This is Brooks theology. <laughs> I think people quit listening. I think God still calls preachers to preach. It's just a question of whether or not we acknowledge that call and say, yes, Lord, yes. I think God still calls missionaries to go, to go start churches in foreign fields and here on American soil. I believe God still calls Christians to be faithful to a local church and to serve right here. If he didn't call you to be a pastor, he didn't call you to be a missionary, he didn't call you to be a Christian school teacher, maybe he just called you to be a faithful member of a local church that is doing those things. I think God wants everybody to be saved and a member, a legitimate member of a Bible preaching church. I believe everybody ought to do that. That's our appeal today. Well, I think the Lord wants me to stop right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we love you and thank you that you have shown us how the light came on for Peter and in various times throughout his life. And Lord, even though the light may flicker at times, we pray that you'd help us to be smart enough just to cling to you even in those dark times so that we might see the light flame up once again. Lord, let each of us seek your will that we may flourish in service to you. Bless this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you please stand?